See it as my- Chris Webster here, and I just wanted to thank all the people that are members of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Of course, our shows are always free, and members are what help keep them free. Other shows are on Patreon and similar sites and make you pay for content, not at the APN. If you want a little extra and want to give back, then head over to arcpodnet.com slash members. That's arcpodnet.com slash members to support archaeological education and outreach. Let's start the episode. You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Archaeologists, Archaeologists don't, don't, dig, don't dig, dinosaurs. dig dinosaurs. Three, two, two, one. Archaeologists, Archaeologists don't, dig, don't dinosaur. dig dinosaur. <laughs> Wait, okay. Okay, all right. Three, two, one. Archaeologists, Archaeologists don't, dig don't dig dinosaurs. Why are we okay. fucking that up? Welcome to episode five of a Life in Ruins podcast. I'm your host, Carlton Gover, and I'm joined by my co-host, Connor Josanin and David Howe. <laughs> Archaeologists don't, don't dig dinosaurs. dinosaurs. Tonight's guest, Amy Atwater, is the Paleontology Collections Manager at the Museum of the Rockies in Bozeman, Montana. She is just an all-around badass. She is an avid science communicator and does so through presentations, videos, and her massively popular Instagram account at Mary Anning's Revenge. Amy was a National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellow at the University of Texas at Austin and has a slew of peer-reviewed publications. She has also published work in the Huffington Post and even appeared on PBS Eons. As a woman in a STEM field that we normally do not talk about, we are super excited to have her on the show. So get your tiny T-Rex arms clapping and waving and welcome, welcome her to the show. Welcome to episode five of a Life in Ruins podcast. Um, we're here with Amy Atwater, um, who is a paleontologist up in Montana. How are you doing today, Amy? I am doing great. Thank you so much for having me. So we just want our viewers to understand a little bit about you. So um, who are you? Like, what are your credentials and what do you do currently? Sure. Uh, so I am a vertebrate paleontologist. Uh, I work at the Museum of the Rockies, uh, which is a part of Montana State University in Bozeman, Montana. I am the paleontology collections manager and registrar here at uh, the museum. So it is my job to keep track of all of the fossils, keep track of all of our loans, uh, make sure things are protected and safe when they go out on loan or go on exhibit. I deal with all of our visiting researchers. I end up doing a lot of social media and other random stuff throughout the day as well. And my area of expertise within paleontology is actually fossil mammals. And within fossil mammals, it's fossil primates. So it is a little funny nice. that I am at a major dinosaur museum, but dinosaurs are cool too. But uh, I, I'm here repping the, the underrepresented mammals for sure. That's cool. Um, so you actually studied anthropology as your part of your master's program. Is that correct? Oh, right. Yeah. I didn't say anything about <laughs> my qualifications. Yes. Uh, so when I was an undergrad, I, I grew up in Oregon and I went to the University of Oregon uh, Clark Honors College for college, where I was a geology major focusing on paleontology, but I did a minor in anthropology at that time. I loved the anthropology classes. They were way more fun than anything else. And then when I applied to graduate school, I applied to work with an anthropologist, a physical anthropologist at the University of Texas at Austin, who was in the anthropology department there. So I uh, have a degree now for my master's in anthropology with an emphasis of course, on biological anthropology and primate evolution and really early primates. I'm not a huge fan of, uh, you know, human evolution. <laughs> that makes uh, three of us that have masters in anthropology. <laughs> nice. Hey, I defend on uh, June 4th, so five days away. So you shut your mouth. I had to get one last one in there. <laughs> oh, you're almost there. <laughs> almost, yeah, I've, I've been in a PhD program for a year and still dragging along my master's up at Wyoming. So it's been a fun year. Oh, I see. Yeah, it's been great. So just for our listeners real quick, 
Um, this is a Life in Ruins podcast, not Walking with Dinosaurs podcast. <laughs> so we are going to keep this uh, this segment with Amy related to the field of anthropology and archaeology and kind of discuss some of these dualities that we have in our two fields. So just as kind of like a caveat as to what this episode is going to entail. But yeah, kind of building off of that, what was your earliest interactions with um, anthropology, archaeology or paleontology? I was born in Utah, actually, but I moved to oh. Oregon when I was about five. But my family's really, really outdoorsy and... My earliest awesome. memories are camping in Utah, and my dad has a degree in geology. He did his first undergraduate degree in geology, so we were always rock hounding and looking, trying to find fossils, and many times that I was looking for fossils as a child, instead, I would find projectile points, and I was like probably the only kid bummed out to find arrowheads instead of fossils. So that, I guess, was my first interaction. And I was always annoyed. I wanted to find a fossil instead. Then in um, middle school uh, in Oregon, I went to a pretty progressive middle school and they had these really fun explore classes, six week long explore classes. So when I was in sixth grade, I took a six week explore human evolution uh, class. And I just, I loved every second of it. I thought it was so cool and fascinating to think about how we as a species have changed and evolved over time and our relatives. And those were the days that Nat Geo would publish all of those crazy like reconstructions of the faces of Australopithecus. And they always were kind of creepy. And uh, I was just mesmerized by all of that. And that's what really opened the door for uh, paleontology for me was the idea of human history and our place in the tree of life. So really, my roots are with human evolution. and I just went for the older critters as much as I could. (laughs) That's interesting. I think uh, I I am a recovering paleontologist. Um, (laughs) So I was like, yeah, I really loved uh, paleontology while growing up as well and did some uh, museum stuff early on. And it's it's funny how you can either fall in love with anthropology paleontology or you know i feel like they're concurrent loves and for a lot of people i used to like beg my parents to take me to the city uh i grew up on long island and we go to the museum of natural history and like see all the dinosaurs for my birthday every year and i was like hyped on it every time i went and i think (laughs) in fourth grade i wrote that i wanted to be like a paleontologist and everyone else was like chef (laughs) and i was like well (laughs) that and then i ended up being an archaeologist so i guess recovering paleontologist too. <laughs> oh, no, that's great. But I think there is a something that unites us in loving to be outside and playing in the dirt. Just loving that experience to be immersive and really close to history. Yeah. yeah and so just to, to define them, what's the what would you define as the difference between archaeology and paleontology? And as a second question, why is archaeology better? I had a feeling that that was going to be a little little jab there thrown in to all of that. Well, the difference between them is that paleontology is cooler uh, and better. But um, I'm just playing. Uh, I really think about differences in archaeology and paleontology being an aspect of time, that there is overlap. And for me, I when I interact with folks, I kind of talk about 10,000 years uh, as being this line that if it's younger than that, then that's fully within the realm of archaeology. And if it's older than that, then it could be potentially both. I've learned that there's this unofficial 10,000 years for to be a fossil, but some people would argue that it doesn't have to be that old to be a fossil. So in that way, I think that the element of time and how paleontologists have to work on extremely, extremely deep time scales and our archaeologists do as well. uh, And that is important, but there is a difference. And uh, I definitely had some interactions in graduate school with some archaeological uh, workers and researchers and professors who uh, we didn't necessarily see eye to eye about sense of time in the Anthropocene. And uh, it was an interesting discussion because I was very critical of 
whether or not we will actually see any preservation from this time period and the scales that you might hear about. Because in deep time, I mean, you're never going to pick up on something as small as even a 100,000 year scale. Uh, so I, I like to play devil's advocate sometimes with my uh, archaeological friends uh, and just kind of question, well, what is deep time? I also really love to throw in things like what is a species and what is uh, an invasive species when you have migration? So there are a lot of overlap. Uh, and then there is also some differences, but I think there's definitely uh, mostly similarities. And I don't get insulted if someone asks me if I'm an archaeologist or confuses the two. Like that's asking a lot from your average Joe to <laughs> know the scientific differences between, you know, pretty derived fields. Yeah. I yeah, no, the, I, I get that question a lot or when people ask what I do and I'm like, oh, I'm an archaeologist and they'd say, oh, so you like dinosaurs? And then the answer is yes, I love dinosaurs. So I just answer <laughs> truthfully and they're like, oh, what's your favorite? And I just like go into it and they're like, well, how many dinosaurs have you dug? I'm like, not a single one. I'm like, oh, well, you're a pretty bad paleontologist then. I'm like, no, I'm actually a really good archaeologist. Um, <laughs> yeah, you get That's extra right. points if you avoid the dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah, right. And I mean, you can be a paleontologist. Like, I I didn't work on a dinosaur dig for a really long time. Oregon doesn't have dinosaurs in their fossil record. It was underwater at the time of deposition. So you can be a paleontologist and not work on dinosaurs at all. And it is, I mean, you can see the little clicks in the paleontological community of the anti-dinosaur folks because they get all the glory and they get all the Hollywood movies and everything. Yeah. So like, let me ask you this at conferences, like, we kind of all like gather into like different like you know cliques but like are you hanging out with like the fossil primate people where you want to go hang out with like the triceratops party <laughs> or like uh, well, being in paleontology, I mean, I've really been active in the community since I was about 14. So for well over 10 years now, uh, I have friends in almost all venues of the field. And I really enjoy just getting to you know, spending time with my colleagues, regardless of what they study. I guess I find myself my core group is uh, Cenozoic mammal researchers, I would say. Uh, that's what Sweet. I did. That's what I did for my undergraduate degree. That's what I focused on in graduate school. So my community is a lot of folks who work on rhinos and horses and oreodonts and elephants and bison, um, mammoths, mastodons, uh, sloths. So that's kind of my core group are the, the extinct fossil mammal crowd. So real quick, when was the Cenozoic and how is it kind of characterized? So the Cenozoic is, and I try every time with Cycoms, thank you, to define that because that's just another kind of jargony word. But the Cenozoic is a time period that uh, is what we call the age of mammals uh, for a lot of folks. It is thought to begin uh, 66 million years ago after the extinction of, and see, I have to do this, the extinction of non-avian dinosaurs. I can't just say dinosaurs because dinosaurs still are alive today. They're birds. <sighs> So the Cenozoic <laughs> begins uh, once we have that huge asteroid event that knocks out all of those Triceratops and T-Rex and all of those iconic dinosaurs. And that really uh, marks the beginning of the Cenozoic time period. And it's still we are still in the Cenozoic today. And there is a debate on whether we're in this time period called the Holocene or if we are in a new time period called the Anthropocene. And I don't. Yeah, no, no opinion on that. But it uh, spans, uh, yeah, sixty-six million years, and uh, go we in North America, especially, and across the whole globe, we see a lot of climatic changes over that time. And uh, studying the Cenozoic is extremely informative for understanding climate change today because we have a record of it and we have a record of it affecting mammals. So why not use that record to understand to the best of our ability our changing climate today? Awesome. So I guess paleontology, what do you feel that you can, because everyone's like archaeology, if you learn about your past, like you can better prepare for the future kind of things like that. Do you feel paleontology is a similar science? Very much so. And if you want to get funding, you better figure out a way to make it relevant <laughs> to today. And it's just the reality of it. I uh, was a National Science Foundation graduate research fellow uh, for graduate school, and my application was largely centered on the Eocene primates that we have in North America. There are these lemur-like and tarsier-like primates uh, that are would have been freaking adorable, which is largely why I'm drawn to them. Uh, <laughs> but we have a record of them. Um, 
coming to North America at about 56 million years ago and then going extinct about 35 million years ago. And primates today are one of the most endangered and threatened groups of animals on the entire planet. And if we want to understand how to prevent the extinction of these primates and we really want to be about good conservation efforts, then we might as that we need to utilize the record that we already have of primate extinction in North America with ties to climate change. It's a, it's a perfect case study, case study in our own rocks. So I focused on that for my uh, NSF proposal, and I encourage a lot of other folks to try and think of their research and how it helps with modern uh, conservation efforts or range expansion and geography and ecology and really trying to tie it into something modern. I have a friend who uh, does paleontology in Kyrgyzstan, and her fossils are one of the only tools they have for understanding earthquakes in that region. And so she's able to get funding, and she was a Fulbright scholar, by having the implications of understanding paleontology to help save human lives through earthquake prevention. So you got to get creative, got to figure out a way. Um, Otherwise, it's hard to uh, convince the general public that it's worthwhile. That's super interesting. Um, how do you guys deal with that on the the slices of time that you see? For like archaeologists, we we can operate, you know, maybe within five hundred years as like a pretty precise or a good span of time to study. Um, how do you study that? You know, going back sixty six million years. I guess it's with a larger error bar. Okay. Okay. (laughs) But it is very, very, very hard to get anything within the the standard deviation and within the range uh, that you have with archaeology uh, being just younger material that you're working with. So it isn't it isn't always. Oh, man. I mean, I think I just I just submitted a paper where we had our error bars were placing a date within like a a million year period. And we (laughs) we were pretty, pretty stoked on that. That was great. Like that really narrowed down what the, the current the previous hypotheses were for that site. And we came in and this is cutting edge to get it within a million years. That would spark some fires in our field. That's that's amazing that that's an acceptable error range. Oh, that and is it gets so scary. much time. That is so much time that it's gone by. <laughs> but it isn't. It isn't when you think about the history of life on Earth. It really isn't that much time at all. My my fiance is a geochronologist. It goes very well. We go well together. And he he laughs at this stuff too. He's talking about tectonic events and. Uh, processes that are happening over the course of hundreds of millions of years and the millions of years is just a snap of the finger and you go deeper and deeper into the time scale you get your resolution uh, gets worse and worse too I mean you're looking at age ranges that are going to be tens of millions of years plus or minus and that's just you work with what you got there's there's nothing you can at this point with technology the older it goes the the higher amount of error you have with your with your ages and the and record, the record like, is what is it is, you know, at this point, <laughs> like you were saying, sorry. And that's just, Carlton. no, you're good. And that's like just amazing, like how there's a difference in con- how we conceptualize time. And like you think like the average person might conceptualize time in like two or three generations, like that is mm-hmm. their window of time. And then for like archaeologists, we might talk about it in like hundreds or thousands of years. Like that is hard. Like that's how we wrap it up. And then for like you guys in paleontology, like you guys think on the span of millions of years. Yep. And, and I couldn't even imagine like a geochronologist, like how they, <laughs> how they conceptualize time. Like that's, it's just really interesting to me to kind of like think about theoretically how people just kind of figure these things out and what's, you know, what's a snap of the finger and how is it compared between the different fields? Oh, definitely. And when someone apologizes, oh, I'm so sorry, it took me like a week to get back to you. I just like laugh at them and go, we're paleontologists. That was a blink of an eye. Like, it's not a big deal. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so it does. It kind of helps. Uh, it helps you not take things so seriously in day to day life when you have that concept of really deep time. Well, sweet. I think that's a good place to end. So, uh, well, everyone, a giant meteor has just struck Earth, which means the extinction of the first session of this podcast. Uh, Following the hell and brimfire, we'll be right back. 
Are you ready to upgrade your GPS so you can use your phone or tablet to map data? Want to use mapping software of choice on your tablet of choice? What about submeter or subfoot accuracy? Ready to get your GPS position fixed faster than you ever have in the past? I mean, come on, we all know how long that can take. Contact the GPS experts at Anatom GeoMobile Solutions to help transition to the latest mapping technology. Visit agsgis.com. That's agsgis.com or call 1 800 980 4649. These guys are pretty great, and I've used some equipment from them. And Matt Alexander, who is the VP of Sales, is an awesome person and will help you figure out exactly what you need. So, agsgis.com, 1 800 980 4649. Hey everyone, Chris Webster here to tell you about all the awesome APN swag over at our T Public store. Check it out at arcpoddent.com slash shop. You'll find APN stuff, but also some great designs that we've had submitted. Get your Bruce Trigger Warning cell phone case or your Bottle Guide t-shirts. So find the link at arcpoddent.com slash shop. That's arcpoddent.com slash shop. All right. Well, welcome back to a Life in Ruins podcast. This is gonna be the second portion of our podcast with Mary Anning's Revenge. Is her, oh, that's not. Oh my God. Why did I do that? Hang on. That's my handle. Most <laughs> people know me handle. by Mary Anning's Revenge. It's totally yeah. fine. I, I respond to that. <laughs> I was looking at the wrong section here on the thing. But anyway, yeah. So we're back here with Amy Atwater, who her Instagram is Mary Anning's Revenge, and that leads me into the next question. Would you mind describing who Mary Anning was? Sure, of course. Uh, Mary Anning was a paleontologist who lived in the southern coast of England from in the early 1800s. Uh, she is well known for, well, huh, not as well known as she should be, for discovering the first complete ichthyosaur fossil, which is like a weird um, marine lizard that kind of looks like a pregnant dolphin. It's a very strange oh. creature. Uh, she found the first complete ichthyosaur. She found the first complete plesiosaur ever known to science, which is that kind of Loch Ness looking uh, marine reptile. Uh, she found the first um, pterosaur, which folks are more commonly used to, pterodactyl. So she found yeah. the first pterodactyl outside of Germany. She was poor as hell. She got into fossils because her family would go find fossils on the coast. They would call them curios and they would sell them in their curio shop to support the family. And when Mary was about 10 years old, her father died and that family business fell squarely on her shoulders to support the family. And she uh, didn't have any education. She was extremely poor uh, and she was self-taught in anatomy. And uh, she really helped push a lot of ideas about evolution way before evolution was even acknowledged. She helped uh, us understand extinction happened. At that point, people were still like, no, things don't go extinct. They are yeah. somewhere else in the world. We just haven't found them yet. And her work really helped elucidate that. No, no, no. Uh, they these are really freaking old and they are no longer here at all. But a lot of her work was uh, taken advantage of. The credit for her finds were given to wealthy men, um, gentlemen of her time. She rarely got credit. She wasn't allowed to join the Geological Society of London, even though she contributed fossils that to this day are in the Natural History Museum of London. Uh, she felt very taken advantage of and she wrote about that, about how the world had treated her so unkindly and taken her ideas without uh, supporting her and her family. Uh, I get very angry and upset about that because unfortunately um, that still happens to a lot of underrepresented groups in the sciences and people want to sure. say like, oh, well, it's so much better now or Mary's gotten her her revenge now. And I go, well, no, because we have no idea how much she did and contributed to that her name was erased from and we will never know what she fully provided. But we do know one fun little Mary Anning factoid, if I may. We do know that she helped figure out fossil poop, which is pretty oh. awesome. And it's really funny because there were these little rocks that everyone called the Bezoar stones, which are actually weird matted stuff and guts of animals. But they found these rocks. They thought they had these medicinal properties. They put them in their tea and she would find these rocks with these fossil ichthyosaurs, these fossil fossil reptiles, and she would find them always in the abdominal cavity, and she'd always find them in the pelvis. And then she decided to break them open, and they were full of little fish bones. And she went.
went, these are poop. <laughs> this is ichthyosaur huh? poop. People are putting poop in their tea to cure them from their ailments. And that work helped coin the term coprolite, which is fossil feces. Well, well, we're familiar with that term. That's for sure. <laughs> yes. Yeah. The copper lights are very important, especially. Yeah. That leads me to, I guess, the the next um, the discussion here. So you you deal with fossils, right? Like as as your job, you don't go out and like dig them up. You're, you're in a curation facility. Is that right? So I am, I am a collections manager. So yeah, my, okay. my job description is to deal with fossils once they've already been prepped completely. So brought out of the field and cleaned up. I do go into the field and do field work because the more the merrier, they're happy to have more hands. And I love being in the field, but no, yeah. my main job duty duties are in the museum. Okay. I'm also a collections manager, but I deal with more obviously archaeology and like historic, you know, artifacts. In American anthropology, we have like laws that say like, you know, if something is dug on federal land and they find a site like you're required to dig that out and curate it in a federal facility. Is there something similar to that in paleontology? Yes, but only recently. Uh, and I have to thank my boss here, actually, uh, Pat Leegee, who's the director of paleontology and exhibits here at Museum of the Rockies. He helped with an excavation of a beautiful Allosaurus skeleton back in the late 80s, early 90s that I bet you've heard of called Big Al. And he had the whole, uh, there are many TV shows dedicated to this dinosaur. Hmm. And that dinosaur was controversial because it was being dug up by commercial collectors who claimed they were on private land, but they were not. They were on BLM land. And it was this whole ordeal because there was no official legislation like there was for archaeological artifacts to protect fossils at the same level. So that led to 2008 or 2009, Obama signed the PRPA, which is the Paleontology Resource Protection Act. And that protects fossils on all federal lands. And very, and it's very similar. If you find a fossil on federal lands, you are not permitted to collect that. Um, you will, If it's a vertebrate fossil, sorry, I should clarify. If you found a shell on BLM land somewhere or on Forest Service land, you could collect that. that that is not a problem. If you wanted to collect bulk quantities of it, then you would need a, a permit. But any vertebrate fossil. So if you found a dinosaur fossil on any federal land, it would be illegal for you to excavate that and take it to your personal home or your personal museum. It would need you'd have to have a permit to excavate it in the first place. And then it would need to go to an official repository, like you said. OK, and, but that's um, but that's only recently, right? Yeah, very recent. And national parks are a little different. You can't take anything from a national park. So I don't want listeners to think that if you find a shell or petrified wood and you're in a national park, you cannot take that. You cannot take any resource from a national park. But other federal lands like BLM and Forest Service, you there's some there are some exceptions. Well, that's that's Thanks, insane Obama. to me. To, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, it's yes. insane. It's like 2008. We're I feel like archaeologists as a discipline are uh, we feel we complain a little bit that our uh, legislation came so late on, but good to know that we are not the latest on protecting our resources. It, and you should know that paleontologists are envious of the protection that uh, archaeological sites have. Um, and to the point where people can be nasty, people will say, like, if you're working a paleo site and you find an archaeological whatever, that you would need to stop your paleo site and you need to bring in your archaeologist. That's federal law. So you can imagine huh. that that makes some paleontologists a little peeved and that they might discourage people from actually sharing that they found an artifact because they don't want to halt their paleo research for archaeological research. So it is a interesting dilemma, I suppose. Um, but yes, we are envious, I could say, as a field for the level of protection that artifacts receive across the board. And hopefully we will get to that one day as well. But it is um, easier when it is, I, I think it's um, easier to protect and more relatable for our lawmakers to think of human history. And it does make sense to me yeah. why we would protect that first and foremost before thinking about even older forms of life. That's kind of a shame because it's like a lot of times in archaeology, like we feel we don't have enough laws to protect archaeology. So then if you guys are already like below that, for, like that must be awful for your science. I'm really sorry to hear that. 
And people like to sell the fossils they illegally collect on eBay. And there is no way to trace and show that that fossil was illegally collected. So, I mean, it's just this constant, like, trying to protect these artifacts. Or, or, sorry, that's fossils aren't technically artifacts. Trying to protect these resources, uh, but also keep them secret enough that people can't go literally pillage them and sell them. So it stinks having, uh, and I'm sure you can relate to that artifacts too. It can be worth ridiculous amounts of money, but we know that they're all truly priceless. Uh, And it's really, really tricky to try to get them protected the way they deserve to be protected. Do you guys have a huge problem with fossil hunters and people legally doing these things or even people that are fossil hunting on like legally, but just selling the artifacts? Like, how does that affect your guys' field? Oh, I mean, there are there is a huge divide in and I didn't see it as much when I was just in mammal land because mammals aren't as hot on the black market or even on the legal market as dinosaurs. So I didn't see it as much before starting here at the museum, but there's a big divide between commercial dealers and, um, I don't want to say academic elitist snobs, but I kind of do mean academic elitist snobs. You know, I think there's a lot of room for us to all come together because we have a ton in common and we all want to protect the same stuff. But there are some very big opinions in the field about how selling fossils and I am friends with plenty of people who sell fossils legally, and I'm not going to tear them a new one for providing for themselves in a legal way. Uh, Mm -hmm. I'd find that inappropriate. But I mean, in an ideal world, all fossils would go to a a museum and be publicly available. Um, But that doesn't always work out. And uh, there is a lot of theft. Um, We have to be extremely, extremely, extremely paranoid about our locality information. Like that cannot get out to anyone. Um, And very often, pretty much every summer I've gone out, there's signs of poaching. Uh, You'll find bits of plaster all over the ground and a big hole in the ground. There's a big problem with things being illegally smuggled into North America from Mongolia and China, which is against the law to leave those countries and to be sold to these rich guys and to Nick Cage and Leonardo DiCaprio (laughs) and whoever. So it is a problem and it's not helped that Hollywood has made these very desirable objects. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Do you guys have a lot of security in your facility? Yes, yes, yes. Lots and lots and lots. (laughs) Many, 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 many keys and locks you must go to to get to uh, any of the fossils. So, yep. No, that's very, very. We have a wonderful security team here. And, uh, you know, they we also have artifacts at Museum of the Rockies. We also are a historical museum to talk okay. about uh, the Native Americans that have lived in this region and also the early pioneers and settlers. So there are a variety of things like there's a whole room full of cars and airplanes. And we have a ton of problems with people just trying to go sit on all the cars and they leave garbage like in these old cars that they're not even supposed to be in. And so we have to have really good security for an assault assortment of reasons. Um, and definitely the, the paleo artifacts are uh, a big part of that. Though really with paleontology, you're way more likely to have someone steal it from the field. Like literally, I've heard of people watching paleontologists waiting for them to leave and then they'll go into the site poach the site and leave yeah. it's a lot less likely for them to even if you got by, through all of the doors of security to get to say the giant triceratops skull right behind me you would have no freaking way of getting out of the building undetected it's a yeah. freaking giant triceratops skull it's like 10 feet long and weighs a ton so here it's not as much of a problem it's really in the field where we can't protect them where there isn't security where our federal government isn't funded well enough to provide the security that we need to protect these really really spectacular and finite resources yeah so for archaeology we have this list called the the list the national register of historic places where we nominate these sites and they are given a certain amount of protection if they're very important to archaeologists and if you if you make a good argument about that um is there anything like that that for paleontological sites or any sort of protection that you can get from the federal government? I, I, I think sometimes we piggyback 
on those, um, especially for things that are Pleistocene and Ice Age, we can get some of the protection from archaeological legislation. And then the other thing I would think of is not paleo specific, but they're like the UNESCO World Heritage Sites. So some fossil sites like the Burgess Shale up in British Columbia is, uh, is protected because it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So that's like international levels of protection. Uh, But so it's more through those veins, not necessarily one that's paleo specific. And uh, something that I've just kind of been thinking about since we've been kind of talking about excavation. Have you ever um, been a part of an archaeological excavation at all? No, I have not. I had to think about that for a second. And then I went, (laughs) no, for all of my archaeology friends who have tagged along on our paleo trips, I do not believe that it has ever gone the other way. No. Well, okay. Well, I wanted to ask you, like, what does a paleontological excavation consist of? Like, what kind of tools do you use? And like, kind of what are the methods you guys are employing to get these fossils out of the ground? Right. I mean, a lot of the technique has not changed in like over 100 years. I mean, we are still using burlap and plaster to carry these guys out. It, we're still having to do prospecting just by walking around and looking. Oh, my gosh, my stepdad, almost every time I see him, he's like, so, Amy, do you guys have that ground penetrating radar like from Jurassic Park so you can see all the dinosaurs before you <laughs> dig them up? And I'm like, Ray, for the millionth time and for the the seventh year in a row, <laughs> that technology does not exist. That is not real. There is some ground penetrating radar, but not for anything deep like that. And so it's, oh my gosh, sorry, that was a total tangent, but that's the kind of stuff I'm like, oh, my own family doesn't understand what I do. Somebody asked me that same thing last week and I was just like, had to smile and be like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like you, sometimes you just can't. <laughs> yeah. It depends on how tired you are and if you want to deal with it or not. <laughs> Yeah, precisely. Uh, But for the most part, things are, I think, probably very similar. Once you discover a site, you are going to be doing all sorts of documentation, using a grid to know exactly where it's coming from in the quarry, trying to figure out if it is a true quarry or if it's an isolated single bone. We now can use some more total station technology to get an idea of the relative uh, taphonomy of a site as well um, and measuring precisely with GIS technology precisely where these fossils came from and what orientation and and if we can find some sort of pattern that would tell how they were deposited there or how they got there. Um, So that's kind of new and improved but a, a lot of the dig stuff is very you know you make a tarp tent over a quarry and you're using the same trowel and brush and pick that we've been using as paleontologists for literally decades. So a lot of that detailed manual labor um, is still the same. And I bet it's pretty similar to an archaeological site, but I'm, I'm not sure because I have not done that. Well, I, I think I was watching a video and I saw they had recovered a large bone. I can't remember what type of bone, but uh, and they had ended up putting it on like this rigged like pla- it wasn't a plastic sled but it was some sort of like sled that you would use for like going down a hill and snow and i just I, it was amazing to me that it's so hard to get out large yes. huge things in the field it seems like yes. insane like <laughs> do you know one of the uh, most commonly used things for paleontologists to get huge jackets out of the field that's like a sled <laughs> We use car hoods. We use the hood of a car. I've seen it multiple times. We have one here at the museum that they're bummed out because it's on its last legs and they don't make car hoods the way they used to. Uh, (laughs) So that's not as consistent. But I've been to a site in Utah that experienced a lot of poaching that... Utah raptors. So if you really want to talk about the velociraptors from Jurassic Park, there you go. And they had such a large jacket that they were trying to crowdfund for helicopters to get that baby out of there. And here at the museum, we have had assistance from the Army Corps of Engineers with helicopters to get big dinosaur jackets out of the field. That's that's nuts. That's super um, and on <laughs> on that note, so if your uh, hood is missing from your car, a paleontologist most likely stole it. Yep. Um, and and that <laughs> and that we're gonna take our second break. So we'll catch you on the other side. 
Hey, I'm Chris Webster, and this is your Wild Note Tip of the Month for October 2019. As we move into the off-season for much of the Northern Hemisphere, you might be wondering what to do with your fancy digital data management software. Well, here are some ideas. WildNote can be used to help catalog artifacts in the lab. Just export a pivot table and import into your existing database. Create new forms to manage proposals and report writing tasks. Not all forms for data collection have to be exported. They can just be used for organization and internal data gathering. Finally, test out new forms for the next field season. Check out our safety forms or build your own. If you aren't using WildNote yet, head over to wildnoteapp.com. That's wildnoteapp.com for all your digital data collection needs and a free trial. Hey everybody, Chris Webster here, and as we head into the off-season for much of the Northern Hemisphere, it's time to buckle down and write those reports. As we all know, the time you work on the report has to be accounted for. That's where Timeular comes in. Timeular is a time-tracking app, but it also has a physical component. Just flip the Timeular cube to the side that represents what you're doing, and it stops time on one task and starts it on another. Check out Timeular over at arcpodnet.com slash Timeular. That's arcpodnet.com slash T-I-M-E-U-L-A-R. Welcome back to a Life in Ruins podcast. We're talking to Amy Atwater, a paleontologist. And I want to ask you, um, because we, I I don't, I think David might have saw saw you on Instagram and that's kind of how we know you through Instagram and social media. Um, So how do you kind of approach uh, science communication um, within your field of paleontology? Oh, that is a that is a broad question. Um, I'm like, my, eyes are, my eyes are saucers right now. I'm like, where do I begin? Um, but to think broadly about it, I mean, a big thing for me in social media, I am in a male dominated field. I'm in a male dominated profession. Um, geology as a whole is also very male dominated. Sciences as a whole are very male dominated. So my thing with social media is to show a strong female paleontologist who isn't beating you over the head with women in STEM, blah, 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 like girls in STEM, women in paleontology, like more of a subtle approach, more of a subtle, hey, every photo I want you to know a woman took, whether it's you can see some nail polish or you can see a ring or you can see a woman in the photo. Um, So I don't like to do a whole lot of, I don't like to always be beating at the gender bias part because that's very emotional and hard to do. But I do like to be subtly, constantly reminding folks that you can look like whoever and be successful in your field. So to make that accessible even further is I try very, very hard to not use jargon. I try very hard not to use those $100 words. Yes, that means that people will sometimes make comments about, oh, you you clearly are so dumb or whatever. <laughs> and I just, I honestly have replied to that and gone, thank you. I try to write at an eighth grade level. So that's a compliment. Yeah. And uh, I, try I to think do that. you do a fantastic job, by the way, like with the the instagram like whatever you just described there like i think you're doing a super great job at it because i don't think you're hammering at it you know over the head with it but like i definitely i noticed your your instagram through like the like a a female paleontologist and i thought that was dope yeah thank you thank you uh and that i just uh I definitely want to show that image and I'm doing it for, I'm doing it for young women and and girls. I really am. I wish that I grew up loving the documentary series, right? Like Bill Mm -hmm. Nye and the Kratz brothers and uh, the crocodile hunter and David Attenborough, like loving that. I used to make my own documentaries all the time, underwater sea adventures with my bad Australian (laughs) accent as like a fourth grader. (laughs) It was epic. And I just remember wishing that I had a female in that role to look up to, to make it seem like I could do that because there was literally no imagery to even suggest that I had a place in this field that I was drawn to. I'm very energetic. I am I'm talkative. I'm passionate. I love all of those things that go into science communication, but there isn't a strong record of women in those positions and it, it ticks me off. So I want to, 
But I mean, I also love what those shows do. I don't think that they're bad. I just think that people have a capacity for more of diverse people to see all sorts of roles and not just women. I mean, I'm a white lady. Like I am (laughs) privileged to high heaven. I mean, all underrepresented groups in the sciences. I really wish that we had more of that um, on the television and on um, social media. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can only think add real quick that your YouTube rap battles are <laughs> absolutely amazing. David sent that to me today and I was in a coffee shop here in Boulder and I watched the horse one and I was crying laughing and I just loved it so much. And everyone in the coffee shop was just staring at me, making sure I was OK, because I was just <laughs> hunched over just dying with laughter about how awesome those videos were and i watched the whale one too and they're just oh my god those are those are premium premium videos i'm equus the horse evolutionary perfection if you think you got this battle gonna need some redirection i'll rule this rap like i've ruled the modern age pliocene innovation for the modern stage it's hip-hop not clippity-clop so back that mic up before you flippity-flop Horse perfection began in the Paleocene when Eohippus entered the primordial scene. Haters gonna feel my Pleistocene rage spilling forth like a glacier from the latest ice age. I'm leggy, yo, Pleistocene top model. I'm up on toe tip while you walk with a waddle. I'm the original gangster, Basil Tony, beef or bronies. All that evolved after me is a bunch of tall phonies. I'm behind all your limited greatness. I work by natural selection, but you get the press. <sighs> Well, thank you. I definitely uh, uh, <laughs> am highly embarrassed by those, but also extremely proud. Like Slot my, that, <laughs> yeah, my whole idea is like, if you make fun of yourself and no one can make fun of you, like you are owning who you are. And so that is my, uh, my co blogger, Megan Weatherall in those videos. And I do need to give her credit that the rap videos were definitely her idea. Um, she has got a lot more rhythm and musical ability than me. And I had to always drink copious amounts of alcohol to record those, (laughs) the audio. I had fun with the, I had fun with the video, but the audio, oh my gosh, I am, I'm mortified by some of those, (laughs) some of those raps. I will never live it down, but thank you. Thank you very much. (laughs) Can I propose a archaeology rap battle between paleontology or paleontology and archaeology rap battle? I want to see that. That I think could we be could make that happen. That could be pretty amazing. Yeah, I think we could totally make that happen. That would be very epic and would probably do very well. It's very relatable. I think we could do finale. it. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I don't know because we sent you the video that me and David made like last year, but we kind of oh the the Clovis Paradise. Yes. Yeah, I did take a gander at that. I was very impressed and <laughs> just impressed and just like wow, dedicated, really dedicated. Yeah, <laughs> I had some theory in there. She did. And I I actually had to make an album of archaeology parody raps for my public archaeology class at Wyoming. So there's a whole host of them and they're all they just get worse and worse and worse. So you can definitely tell what how close to the deadline I was in making those songs up. (laughs) That's awesome, though. I mean, that's great. Psycom, probably, you know, it's probably really relatable stuff. That's how people that's how we can break down these barriers of being this gatekeeping kind of academic field is to do silly things where we show our vulnerabilities which allow people to relate to us so i think that's gonna be our strength oh absolutely Uh, i think the biggest critique i ever get is like the lyrics are amazing and it's really clever you just need someone else to sing them and i'm like you know (laughs) (laughs) yes i can relate to that yes and someone else to film maybe and like not perform in front of a shower curtain of the ocean and yeah there's a lot of room for improvements so with like the fact that we can just go on YouTube and make like a stupid archaeology or paleontology rap, you know, and like with your your Instagram's crushing it, by the way, I like just started. But like, I, I think it's super cool that like when I was a kid, like growing up watching Steve Irwin and Mythbusters and I guess Bill Nye too. I think we watched Bill Nye like in school, like he was a big part of my childhood. Anyway, like they all have network backing, like that was on like Discovery Channel or something like that and whatever. But like now you got all these kids on YouTube that like have a channel about like you know, playing video games or like whatever the hell they do. But then like you and I can go out there and just make a social media profile that's just preaching science. And I think that's like pretty cool. So like, how does that feel for you? Like, do you feel like there's a lot of weight on your shoulders? I just talked a lot. So I'm going to let you talk. 
<laughs> I, I feel like it can go, I can see the positives and negatives. I think it is incredible how we have so much more citizen science going on and we're a lot yeah. more relatable and I love it. I, I followed this, this young woman in paleo and you know, she like put on her story like, Oh my God, you started following me. Like I was like <laughs> tickled. I thought that was so funny. I was like, well, duh, I'm a human. Like I literally am not, it's not like 12,000 people follow me around all the time. I just live. And the fact that you see, seem to think I'm this quasi celebrity is hilarious to me. And it's cool that we are relatable. You can just shoot us a message and you can talk to some of the leading experts in a variety of fields. What is intimidating for me is I would love to step it up to either maybe a podcast level or a YouTube level. And I just get so intimidated by all of the equipment and all of the software and all of the hoops and training that I don't have. I've got very limited graphic design background. I, sure. You've seen the rap <laughs> videos. You know the quality. It's not great. So I, the thing that I am jealous of of these series with networks and backing is that you can just focus on being the expert and the personality and you don't have to be squashed and taken down by all of this on you know the important stuff to make it actually work that's what intimidates me so i'm you know hats off to you guys for starting this podcast especially while guys some of you are in school that is i i can't i can't even imagine like that's really admirable and maybe one day (laughs) maybe Yeah, if we can if we can do it, you can do it. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And I have to add, like this this wouldn't even been possible if it wasn't for the Archaeology Podcast Network because they are um, our producers, like especially Chris, like they do all the the heavy lifting. We just have to record and have weekly meetings, but like our producers are the ones that are like editing all of our our bullshit out and fixing it up so we have a good podcast. Like without them, this would be horrible. This would just be a train wreck. (laughs) Yeah, this would be garbage. (laughs) It would just be, yeah, just the worst. But I also have to add is like, not only are you talking on, on your um, Mary Anning's revenge of, of science and like fines, but one of your most recent posts about being kind to yourself in academia, mm-hmm. like really struck a deep yeah. chord with me. Cause like I came across really that and I was this. just like that, especially in academia and being in the graduate level, the challenges that you have to overcome, not just with academics, but like just within yourself and and suffering from like imposter syndrome, like everybody goes through it. And it's and and it's not really talked about a lot. Nope. No. And I know my first year, my first semester at Wyoming, I had like around finals time. I had an, uh, a previous partner that went, went to jail while I was doing finals. And I had so much personal issue going on. Like I was thinking about dropping out of grad school, like right then and there. And if it wasn't for two of my colleagues, Alex Crabe and Alex Garcia, who will never listen to this podcast, um, <laughs> uh, who, who walked me through it and like, dude, everything's going to be fine. Just and, and they helped me through the whole process. But like there was a there was a serious time where I was thinking about just like giving it up. I was like, I'm not I'm not worthy to be here. Like I'm a fraud. And uh, I think for you to publicly talk about that, something like a very personal experience and putting on a public platform, uh, that takes a lot of courage. And I, I like seriously applaud you. And I'm like really grateful that, that you have done that and to bring that yeah, out. Yeah, I saw that. The, but- yeah, because that resonated with me like hardcore. And like, as soon as I like read it, I was like, oh my God, this is like, yes. Cause I was like, that's exactly <laughs> like what I, I experienced. And like, I think Carlton hit it, like the imposter syndrome and just like, at least at, at my point, I was trying to figure out like who I was at that point. And then like, you're also like, am I good enough to be here? Like that person's way better than me. I don't know. I, I'm assuming you've clearly had some of the same feelings. Uh, yes, I'm graduate school was without a doubt the I mean, with the exception of probably my parents divorce, um, the worst period of my entire life. And I, I was very much a perfectionist uh, before that. And like, I must do everything and I must be perfect and I must be the best and I must achieve and I must have it. You know, I can't ever show any weakness. And yeah, my first semester, I was hospitalized. I was hurting myself. I was suicidal. I was in the worst state of mind. Um, I mean, I, my partner, 
my my partner i mean yeah and my partner was there with me um but that didn't necessarily he was also starting grad school so he was dealing with his own stuff and i had to literally i mean there was yeah there was a night when i realized that i had to prioritize my mental health or else i was gonna die Um, and i've gotten into some tense discussions with other academics i had a woman once on a field trip turn to me and go do you have a phd and i responded to her with well no but i'm alive so i'll be pretty happy about that thanks and i do (laughs) want to i do want to be honest i i'm proud of myself and where i am and i'm maybe i wouldn't be able to say that if i didn't have a job that i freaking love but i was accepted to do a phd at ut austin they did not accept master students in my department i was freaking miserable every semester was hell Uh, the department i was in i would not recommend i clashed with my advisor Uh, we Mm -hmm. had very different ideas of our my trajectory and i bailed I bailed. I, after three years, I took the master's, which they made you do. And I, you know, essentially did the double middle finger and said, I'm out. Um, And I just want, I want to be real about that because there's such a freaking stigma in academia about getting through it. And, oh, well, you just didn't try hard enough. Well, you just didn't work hard enough. And I've seen those people and they're miserable. And I would rather enjoy life and my dog and my cat and my fiance and RuPaul's Drag Race and sewing and (laughs) hiking than telling myself constantly that I have to keep going or else I'm horrible and defining myself by progress and only being kind to myself in the face of progress. I had to stop all of that, go back to the basics, embrace mindfulness. I was in my therapist's office all the time during graduate school. I spent way more time on mental health than on graduate school work. And it was the best choice I made because I'm alive. So it's a big passion of mine to be honest about that and be there for other people um, because it isn't talked about. You are definitely the, the imposter syndrome is real for everyone. And you are encouraged to just be this soulless machine that isn't allowed to ever enjoy anything. And I can't do that. Yeah, I mean, it, they a lot of academia makes you put on pause the rest of your life, and it's it's always going on. Things are going on. You know, people get divorced, people die. You know, these things are always <laughs> affecting your, you and yourself. And I, I, it's hard to hear that. It's frustrating to hear that people, you know, would ask you if you have a PhD, especially when you've you've gone through your master's degree and done all the hard work it's just it's crazy to me but they want that credit because they were so i'm i'm sorry i know that you one of you is working on your phd now but i'm just gonna keep going they no, folks who do. have done their phd are stubborn as all hell my fiance is in the final por- portions of his and i am going a little nuts and being supportive yay but you have to be so stubborn so by the time you get through it because you have to have such a thick skin to survive that you you want to be proud of that and you don't want someone to tell you like oh hey i think everyone should be in therapy which is what she then said well do you have a phd you couldn't be in therapy and get a phd and i said that's bullshit sorry but i said that's not true you know it just was yeah you're there's always going to be that kind of mindset of that it's this weird jealousy in a way of how dare you take care of yourself how dare you prioritize yourself and I've watched friends of mine who can't who can't really articulate it because they're not taking care of themselves. Um, but there's definitely this weird kind of like jealousy that you're not miserable like they are. Like, how dare you? Yeah. So it's it's a dangerous mindset. I mean, I in, in my career, academic career, like the most influential and helpful people that I've had were people with masters. And like the most people that I interact with, and I know for me personally, the reason why I have to get, I have to get a PhD is in order to get the credit that comes with it in order to do what I want to do. And that is, right. you know, it's just like, and it sucks. And like, I, yeah, I go, I go to counseling once a week on top of teaching students, on top of doing my own research, on top of helping my professor do his research on top of this podcast. And also I run a small tribal museum in Pawnee, Oklahoma, and Honestly, wow. yeah, I know. And and uh, this podcast, I have to say, has been like a lifesaver for me, especially like this past semester to give me something else to focus on, something that I want to do um, with my buddies and like new friends that I make through this with all of our guests. And it's 
people don't really realize. You know, I, I had an argument with a friend about uh, from undergrad, and she was just like, "Well, I would love to be in your position so I could be a student again." And I'm like, "I don't think you understand the kind of work that goes into like a graduate school. Like, this isn't." Like my my master's is not the equivalent of yours from Liberty Online. Like this is kind of a whole different right. ball game. And yeah. for you to just kind of like say, oh, I wish I could be a PhD student because like then I could be a student again and live like I did in undergrad. It's like, no. <laughs> like, Yeah, that's it's uh, I mean, it's disrespectful. It's kind of derogatory to your experience and making light of something that is actually a shit ton of work and that can not yeah. feel great. Um, well at that, I'm going to have to, or we have to wrap up here, but I, I will say like with not being in PhD school right now and having a job, like I do have time for the social media and things like that. And like, I, I really enjoy that aspect of it. But on, on that note, like I assume you feel the same. And would you like to plug anything that you want the audience to hear? Oh, right. You told me about this and I didn't necessarily prepare anything. Uh, but no, I think that I would encourage uh, listeners to, uh, I mean, I must plug my museum. I love Museum of the Rockies. It's a really cool place. Bozeman is a spectacular city. I'm an outdoor junkie. So living in a place with mountains and recreation and fossils is pretty spectacular. You can follow Museum of the Rockies on Facebook and on Instagram and Twitter. And uh, then my personal account is Mary Anning's Revenge. You can find me under that handle on Instagram. I'm on Twitter under my own name. Uh, Megan has more. Uh, Mary Anning's Revenge is actually our blog. So I encourage you to go to Mary Anning's uh, Megan runs more of the Twitter on that under Mary's Revenge. I do more of the Instagram on Mary Anning's Revenge, but I'm on Twitter as well. My coworkers finally, finally guilted me into it. So. <laughs> I am there I and know. support your local, mu- support your local museums. Yes. <laughs> Perfect. Well, we just dug down deep to the dinosaurs with Amy Atwater. She is the paleontology collections manager at the museum of the Rockies in Bozeman, Montana. And remember, and remember archaeologists, archaeologists don't, don't, dig, don't dig, dinosaurs. dig dinosaurs. That was a train wreck. But oh, we, oh my God. Thank, <laughs> thank goodness. More for me. <laughs> Thanks for listening to a Life in Ruins podcast. You can follow us on Instagram and Facebook at a Life in Ruins podcast. And you can also email us at a Life in Ruins podcast at gmail.com. And remember, make sure to bring your archaeologists in from the cold and feed them beer. So what did the first dinosaur that was discovered say to the paleontologist that dug it up? I don't know, Connor. What? Jesus. It's such an honor. My friends and I have been dying to meet you. Get out. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Why? You're going to be a great father. (laughs) This show is produced by the Archaeology Podcast Network, Chris Webster and Tristan Boyle in Reno, Nevada at the Reno Collective. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. And welcome to episode five of a Life in Ruins uh, podcast. Um, God damn it. Every time. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks for listening all the way to the end. This is Chris Webster with a quick reminder to check out archpodnet.com slash members to help support us in archaeological education and outreach. That's arcpodnet.com slash members. Now go listen to more podcasts. 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 Now go listen to more podcasts.